Thanks so much for joining us today. We'd love to know how God is using this ministry to touch your life. So please take a moment and send us your story by going to ChristianLifeRantool.com and clicking Amen Central. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. Um, well, that was a WCIA commercial I just wrote, repeated, I'm not sure. Anyhow, we are com- continuing our, our, our service uh, called With Us. And today we're going to look at a passage in the Bible that I would say is probably as popular as any passage in the Bible is to most of us and, and look at it and kind of get some insight as to what God is expecting of us. But before we do, because it's Christmas, I just need to talk a little bit about Christmas, okay? First of all, be honest now, how many of you remember exactly what you got last year that was your favorite present? Anybody remember anything they got last year? How about what you gave, which was your favorite present to give away last year? How many of you remember that? So we've got a couple to do. I'll tell you, this this is a present I get every year and a gift that just keeps on giving. For those of you who can see it, it's jockey underwear. That's, that's the gift I get. It just warms my heart. Um, I, got a, I got an early Christmas present about a, uh, several days ago. It was just one of those things you just don't expect. It just kind of knocked on my heart and it was just overwhelming. I, I, had, I had to receive it as a gift. Um, I went down to Urbana to visit with an elderly client of mine I hadn't seen in about 10 years and was meeting with her daughter and her talking about some things. And I walked in the door and she says, boy, you've changed. And I said, yeah, we're, we're getting older. And uh, so we had our nice 45-minute meeting, and as I'm leave, leaving, she says, you know, you've really changed. And I said, yeah, I know, we're getting older. She says, no, you gained a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought a minute, and I said, did my wife tell you to say that? So that was the gift I got. <laughs> Out of the word of mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be confirmed. Well, that's going to be one of my resolutions, I think. So anyhow, um, We are going to look today um, at a passage in uh, Matthew 2. Before I do, I want to pray. Um, You know, we sang some words and songs. You know, God orchestrates things. And I just want to pray. Some of the words of the songs we sang this, this morning, so let go my soul and trust in him. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and wind still know his name. And then from another song, you reign in our hearts, you reign above all. You're with us. And Father, my prayer is that as we leave here today, the words of those songs are more meaningful to us than when we came in, Lord. We need to let go and trust you, Father. We need to believe that you can and will reign in us as we submit to you. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you are familiar with the song, We Three Kings of Orion R? I think it's one of those Christmas standards. How many of you would like to know that there's nothing in the title of that name that's true? Okay, they weren't kings, there weren't three of them, and they weren't from the Orient. But other than that, it's a great song, okay? <laughs> We're going to look at that. We're going to look at that story now. If you would put Matthew 2, 1 through 11. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east, Magi, wise men, came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born, King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Verse five, in Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they'd heard the king, they went on their way and the star had seen when they rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming to the house. They sat saw the child 
and with his mother Mary and bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And I've heard it said, when we meet the living Savior, the route of our life changes dramatically. You know, this is, for most of us, I would say many of us, one of the more popular passages in the Bible. Surely in our family, we read it every Christmas morning. But as well known as this story is, it's completely shrouded in mystery. Let me just read you a couple of things we don't know. You know. First of all, why is it that of the four Gospels, Matthew is the only one that reports this amazing story? And by the way, who are these guys? Remember the Paul, Paul Newman movie? Who are those guys? Who, how, many stars, how many stars were there? Was this one star? They saw it rise? What, what, what's that all about? How many were there? How many guys were there? Where did they come from? Who sent them? Why would men from the east ask such a question? They got plenty of kings over there. Why do they need this king? Herod was troubled. We know that, and we'll talk about that. But it says all Jerusalem with them was troubled as well. How could they connect this rising star they saw with the birth of one in Israel? And what did they do with that knowledge when they got home? So we are here we have this story. We're going to talk not so much about these mysteries. We're going to talk about what we do know from this story. And we, first of all, we see that here are these three men that traveled a long way, or three men, I say, take that back. How many of our men there were that traveled a long way and they presented these, king, these gifts to the king? And let, let me take you back to Old Testament times. This was par for the course. This is what people did in those days when they came and they visited a, a king. In 1 Kings 10, it says, the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord. She came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold, and precious stones. That's how she presented herself to the king. In 2 Chronicles 17, Jehoshaphat was about to, to assume the, the, the rule of Ju Judea. And it says, and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat so that he had great wealth and honor. Again, the, the custom was, you go present yourself to a king, you bring him gifts. And poor King Saul, some of the people didn't like the fact that King Saul was appointed king. And so what did they do? They showed their displeasure by not bringing him the gifts that you would bring to a king. But here we have these wise men coming from the east. They bring gifts. What do they bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts suitable for a king, a priest, and a dying savior. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts suitable for a king, a priest, and a dying savior. I'm going to change the order as we look at these because I want to focus on one of them. But the first gift I want to talk about is frankincense. Frankincense was an incense that was derived from a resin that was pulled out of, cut out of a tree, a very, very rare tree in the east. And it was used for different purposes in the Old Testament. One of the purposes it was used for was it was used by the priests as they made offerings, sacrificial offerings in the Old Testament. So when the, the frankincense was brought to Jesus, it was brought because he is a priest. In fact, he says, you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He is a priest that offered one sacrifice for all time. He died for us, and yet he says he continues to make intercession for us. He is a priest who ever lives to make intercession for us, according to what Hebrews and Romans tells us. So he, he, they brought him this frankincense because he is a priest, and that was what priests use. The second gift that they brought was what? Myrrh. And if you, get a, if you do go into your concordance, or if you don't have a concordance, go to Google. That can be your concordance. And you look at all of the times myrrh is mentioned or used in the, the Bible about 17 times. Used for various th things and times and places. Queen Esther was preparing herself to be presented to the king, and she, was, she bathed in myrrh. And we see myrrh was a perfume in other places in the Old Testament. But for Jesus, it had a particular purpose. See, myrrh was also used in, in embalming people for death and burial. And this was the one person ever born on the face of the earth in the human history that was born for the purpose of dying. So they brought to him myrrh because he was going to be that sacrificial savior that, was di that would die for us. And they, the myrrh was representative or emblematic of the fact that he was a dying savior. 
So we have the frankincense that was brought. We have the myrrh, but we also had what? Gold. And gold was brought because he was a king. And we read the king, Queen of Sheba. We heard about Jehoshaphat. You brought gold because it was the most valuable metal on the face of the earth at that point. In time. It was representative of wealth. It was representative of being a king. And so people brought, in fact, the, the, the word gold is mentioned, I think, 385 times in the Bible. That's, that they had brought gold to honor the king, to, to give glory to the king. Um, but before the, the uh, and we're going to talk more about this gold, before the, the Magi brought the gold and the, fr the frankincense and the myrrh and laid it at Jesus' feet, they did something else. What does it say? They worshipped. They worshipped. Here are three, three men, I say, keep saying three men because I've been schooled that way, but we have these magi who came to Jesus and they fell down. Here's a young, young kid living at home with his mom and dad, far less than two years old, we believe, and yet they worshipped. They fell down, they bowed down, they fell to their, their knees and they worshipped him. They looked at this baby toddler and they saw him as the king of the Jews. That's who they came looking for. They found him. And, and here's the thing, people. We like to refer to Jesus as our Savior. We'll bring myrrh to Jesus and lay it at his feet because we want him to be our Savior. We need a Savior. We love the fact that he's our priest, that he's ever interceding for us. We love that. But do we want to bring him gold and lay that at his feet and say, you're my king? You're my king. And that's what we're going to be talking about. He is the king. Say that with me. He is the king. Luke 19. As he approached the descent from the Mount of Olives, and this was where Jesus is making his triumphal entry, and it, it records this in Matthew, I believe Mark, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully in a loud voice for all the miracles they had say, saying, Blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. See, not, not just the wise men from the east now saw him as the king of the Jews. His disciples and other people were starting to get the understanding. He's the king. Revelation 19, 16. When Jesus returns, it will be what? As the king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16. And on his robe and on his thigh... He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When he returns, folks, he will be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That means he is in charge of everything, everybody, for all time. That's what he'll be, and that's what he is today if we will receive him that way. A couple years ago, I think, a couple different times, we were doing a series, and we were looking at the, the name and nature of this person, Jesus, and we played this video a couple times that was uh, taken from a sermon that a gentleman named S.M. Lockridge, who was a, a preacher, that he preached in Detroit. And he's talking about this person, Jesus, and he begins by saying, the Bible says he's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. And he, start, he finishes that by saying, but do you know him? Do you know him? He's the king of kings, but is he your king? Is he my king? We're going to talk about that. Before you try to answer that question, is he really my king? Let's look at Herod's struggle. Because I think we look at Herod's struggle, then we have to be honest that we can look at the mirror and say, you know what? I got struggle too. Herod is ruling in, in, in Israel, it says. He's the king of Israel. His father had done some good things, so Rome put him in charge. His father died, so he became king. And so what? You know what? He's king. He's in charge. You like being in charge? Yeah, we all like being in charge. We all like having authority. We all like saying, you know what? When I speak, people listen. When I, when I say X, people got to do X. And that's the way it was for Herod and Israel. But now all of a sudden, these wise men, these magi, these, these uh, stargazers, these people who interpret dreams, they come and they say, we've come looking for he who is king of the Jews. And I don't think that Herod heard any other word other than king of the Jews. Because wait a minute, that's who I am. And, and, and if he's going to be the king, then what happens to me? 
I no longer have rule. I no longer have the right to make decisions. I'm no longer on the throne. Wait a minute, I, I, I can't live with that. I can't deal with that because I want to be king. And we know the story of what Herod. Herod wanted to know particularly when the child was born because he had in mind he was going to make sure nobody took him off the throne. Nobody was going to displace him as king. He wanted to be king. And so he asked them when the child was born or when they saw the star going up because he did end up sending people to Bethlehem and killing every child that was born within the time frame that Jesus was born. And yet he said, I want to come worship him. So let me ask you this question. Do you come here this morning saying, yeah, I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship. But in my heart, I'm really not sure that I want Jesus to be king. I want him to be savior. I want him to be priest. But I'm not willing to submit my all in all so he can be my king. He can be my decision maker. And why? Why is that? I will suggest to you that in my own life, as I look at it honestly, it's a question of trust. It's a question of trust. Are we willing to recognize him as king? Are we allow him to, willing to allow him to sit on the throne of our lives? Let's look at, some, let's look, look at a little video that will help us bring clarity to this question. Jesus, I have decided to give you this. Really? Yeah. You know whoever sits here makes all the decisions, right? I know, and I'm always making decisions, but you make the perfect decisions, so you just sit right down and start making them. Wow, I'm honored. I mean... This feels great. Kathleen, guess what? I just got my new credit card. It's time to go shopping. Oh, really? I thought your husband and you were going to pay off debt. Oh, yeah. I mean, money's kind of tight, but I figured he doesn't have to know about it. So do you want to oh. go with me? No. No? Why? Uh, what I mean is, uh, I don't know. Um, oh. So let me check my schedule, and then I'll get back to you. Okay, yeah, give me a call. Okay. Kat, what's going on? What do you mean? Well, I'm kind of one cheek in it here. Look, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. You wanted me to sit here, right? Well, of course. And whoever sits here makes all the decisions? Right. So what's the problem? Uh, there's not a problem. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. Really, please, here, sit down. As long as you're sure. I'm sure. Okay, okay. so let's start over. Okay. All right. Kat, I noticed that you've been losing your temper a lot lately. Right. So, okay, Jesus, you know what? I know what you're going to say, but um, see, you, do? you don't know the whole situation, you know? Oh, I, well, all I'm saying is that your attitude is a decision. Yes, of course, but I have a lot going on right now. Well, I know you're under a lot of pressure. Pressure? Jesus, you don't understand pressure, okay? This I, isn't working, Kat. What? We can't both sit on the seat. It's either me or it's you. Okay, I know. You know, I just, I didn't think it was going to be this hard, but here, just take it. No, I'm not going to take it. You have to give it to me. Okay, here. Kathleen, make a choice. I can't. You just did. So when we don't make a choice to allow Jesus to be the king to sit on the throne of our lives, we are making a choice. We're saying, I'm going to be the king. We sang the song, so let go, my soul. Let go, my soul, and trust in him. The wind and waves still know his name. Just so happens that our church is outfitted with the same thing we saw in the video. So who is it that's got the decision-making seat in your lives right now? And let, let me just start out maybe a little bit easier. Look around the room for a second. Now consider anybody else in the room but yourself and Jesus is there anybody besides Jesus that you'd like to sit on this throne? Anybody? Anybody at all? My wife says, absolutely not you. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me make it a little bit easier. Let's just suggest for a second that I now give you the phone directory for Champaign-Urbana. Anybody whose name is listed in this phone directory that you'd like to have sit on the throne of your life making decisions besides Jesus? Anybody? Now I have a book with perhaps the names of every influential person in history. Anybody's name in this book that you trust to make the decisions before Jesus? Anybody? Anybody? So here's the point. If you don't trust anybody here, you don't trust anybody in Champaign County, you don't trust anybody in history more with your decision making than Jesus, 
Why is it that each one of us are like this young woman in the video? We won't let go of ourselves in that decision making. We have such a hard time and it's a function of trust. We don't trust Jesus because we don't know him well enough. We haven't been with him. We haven't extended our faith often enough to trust him in making those decisions. So who's on the throne of your life really? Is Jesus the king? Who's the king? Is he the king of your work life? Is he the king of your playing life? Is he the king of your thought life? And I was thinking about that last Sunday. My wife and I were driving home from Memphis, thinking about my thought life and say, you know what? I got a lot of work in that there because I'm still obviously in control of that a lot of times. And we're driving down Highway 55 in Missouri on our way home, and we see a semi that's off the side of the road. You know, semis drive down the road. We drive past them. They drive past us. We have no idea what's inside them. They're just going down the road. Unfortunately for this semi, it had crashed, and all of its contents had spilled out, and we saw everything that that semi was carrying. And it says, there's nothing hidden that but shall not come to view. And so our thought lives, we need to surrender those to Jesus. I tell you what, I don't want my thought life on this screen. I need to surrender it to Jesus so that his thoughts become my thoughts. So who's your king? What's your king? Who's your king? What's your king? I would suggest to you that your king is to whoever you give your time, your talents, your energy, your passion. That's where your king is. Jesus said it this way, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. So who's the king in your life? I suggest to you that we've pre presented enough to, today to understand that Jesus is the king of the universe. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, but is he our king? Let go my soul and trust in him. The wind and waves still know his name. So Jesus is the king. So what gift can I give to Jesus that would be befitting the king? Not just the king, but the king of kings and lord of lords. What do you give the God who owns everything? You know, we get to heaven, it says the streets are paved with what? He ain't impressed with that. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything we have is his. So what do you give the king who has everything? What do you give the king who has everything? The gift Jesus asks us to give is our heart. Proverbs 23, 26. Wisdom is speaking here. It's Jesus' Christmas gift. My son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. You know, and it's amazing, folks, when you think about it. And I, and I had a crystal clear, firsthand view of this this week. In a moment, everything you have can absolutely be taken from you. All your wealth, all your health, all your relationships, they can all be taken from you. But the one thing God can't take from you and won't take from you, as we saw in the video, is your decision to let him be the king, your heart. He wants us to give us, give him our hearts. He wants us to give us, him, his heart. What do you mean, Bill, when you say give him your heart? What do you mean? You, you, that means all of your passions, all of your desires, all of your thoughts, all of your energy, all of your emotions are directed to fulfilling his will in your life. You say, boy, that's a lot. <laughs> How can you possibly expect anybody to do that? And the obvious answer is I can't. In our own flesh, we can do nothing. You know, I had a conversation a couple weeks ago in our little prayer group. Without Christ, I can do nothing. With Christ, I can do all things. So there's a pretty wide gap. Bill, nothing, Christ, all things. So if I'm to give him my heart, I can't do it. I need his help in doing it. The good news is, the good news is he's made a way. We have this exchange. We have this exchange. We give him our heart, and he asks us so he can in turn exchange, empower, and enrich them. He can exchange, empower, and enrich them. Ezekiel 36, we give him our heart, and he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh 
and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Let me read that again. I will put your, my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. In other words, all of a sudden we're gonna have not only the ability but the desire to allow him to sit on the throne because we have his spirit and heart in us. Then you shall dwell in the land I gave you, fathers. You shall buy my people. I will be your God. I will deliver you from all uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. So we have this decision to make today, tomorrow, every day, many times a day. Who sits on the throne of our lives? Who sits on the throne? Who makes the decisions? The promise is we give him our heart, which is the only thing he can't take from us because he wants it voluntarily. We give him our heart and he replaces it. He exchanges it. He enriches it. He enlivens it so that we can be all that he wants us to be. So in coming to the king, he is our king. Be honest. Say, you know what? Jesus, I, I, I'm, I, I'm one cheek in it here. I need to get off so that you can get on. Give me grace today. Show me, show me, Lord Jesus, how I can do this so I can be all that you want me to be for your kingdom. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or want more information, please visit ChristianLifeBrandTool.com.